Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm excited to be here, and I'm very humbled to be here in such a esteemed university here. It's what I don't know if they are or not. You better help me here. I got double mic here, so bear with me. This is this is like pretty intimidating. There we go. Thank you. Yep. Can can you hear me now? Okay. And if you are hearing impaired and like I am and have trouble, please um, please holler. Okay. But um, and thanks to the Alabama Water Institute for giving me a chance to come down here and share a little bit about what we've been doing in our small school. Bucknell is a small liberal arts college. It sits on the banks of the Susquehanna River. That's the town of Lewisburg. See the little water towers up there? I don't know where I put the water towers there are right there on campus. There. So we're looking upstream here across the broad, beautiful alluvial valley of the Susquehanna River, which our geologists state may be one of the oldest rivers in North America. But I'm happy to be here on Earth Day. And to get to know you guys a little more, I would like to play a little Earth Day Jeopardy. But before that, short answers. Can everybody stand? <coughs> Thank you. All right. If you have done the following to these questions, remain standing. Have you recycled in the past month? Good. Have you composted your food waste at home in the past month? That's really hard for the students. <laughs> Don't feel bad. Does the university compost the food system here? Yes. Okay. It's okay. So maybe you could sort of half stand, but maybe just continue eating in any ways here. So we have a few stringers standing up here. Have you biked or walked to work or some local place like the post office or the grocery store in the past year? Good. Have you read a book on... Earth Day or global sustainability? <laughs> okay. I think Brock wins. Brock, okay. Um, well, we'll ask him a, a really tough one, Brock. Uh, what senator started Earth Day in 1970? Promulgated it. I was, I was in elementary school. And I remembered his name because it was so unusual, Gaylord Nelson. And the young man was Dennis Hayes, who bear my, I'm not related to him, who did the first organization. There was no Clean Water Act then. There was no Clean Air Act then. But now get ready for the tougher questions. You ready? So this team right here is team one. This is team two. And you can clap when you have the answer. This US National Forest has 28 named mountains, including Chahia Mountain, the highest and most prominent peak in, in oh, we already have it. What is? Talladega. What is oh. Talladega National Forest? Valley and Ridge Province, just like we have up where I'm from. This Mississippian Native American settlement in Tuscaloosa County on the banks of the Black Warrior River was once the largest city in America. Yes. What's that? Moundville, it's right, tie one and one. Now, I don't know Jeopardy good enough, so I can't give us dollar values. I did try to have the dollar value for, but you get the idea here. Yeah, Moundville, very rich Native American presence here. Very, very rich. The number one cause of water quality impairment in the Black Warrior River comes from, that's a little hard, clap. Mining, coal what? mining, what is coal mining? What is coal mine discharge? That's right. And just so you don't feel bad, that's our home river too. We're a coal state. My grandparents came from Wales to work the mines and I was born in the coal fields of Johnstown, coal steel fields, Western PA. The most threatened invertebrate species in all about Alabama's watershedways are or is. What is freshwater mussels? If you would have said snails, I would have taken that too. Mollusca, you have both, you have this. This is one of the most endangered. 
Um, unfortunately, Black Warrior River has the most number of exti uh, highest extinction just because of, uh, anybody know why? We have them on the Susquehanna too. This puppy, th this, this muscle here lives to about 150 years old. Can you believe that? Yeah. You know why? They depend on migratory fish to propagate. They can't swim. And so whenever they're little, they'll squirt the fertilized eggs called Euclidia up onto the gills of a host fish. Could be a shad, could be something, uh, could even be a bass. And then that's how they'll swim up and then when they fall off. We have so many dams on the Susquehanna, you have so many locks. It's working well. One of the most endangered fish species in Alabama waterways, same as with here, same across the country, is clap. The darters in general, yeah, the watercress, yep, and, and stone roller here is, is another one, a boulder darter. So yeah, darters, mussels, and snails, they're, they're just imperished. And this is not gloom on Earth Day, these are opportunities. I now see these as opportunities. Okay, now we're going to get a little air quality here. What 200, 2015 agreement was adopted by 196 countries with the aim of keeping global temperature rise under two degrees Celsius. It was, what's that? I hear what? The Kyoto, did you say? Paris, that's right. I said Paris. Paris, okay. Kyoto. It's the Paris Agreement. The Paris Agreement here. And there they're celebrating, and unfortunately we withdrew from that. Uh, for the for the fear that it would cause economic downturn, and um, I think there's a role for us in the universities now to show the, how the the science and the engineering is showing that it actually causes economic downturn, not to to be part of these sort of things here. Okay, what's the 1997 protocol established? The modern review and verifications of emissions target, huh? Now, now is the Kyoto. Yeah, you guys did pretty good. You did great, I think. So give you a round of applause here. So when you look at this picture here of the Black Warrior River, what do you see? A sunset. A sunset, a beautiful sunset. Sun. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful sunset. A barge. A barge, a working river. Mm -hmm. Commerce, rivers of transport. What else? A bridge, more transportation, and the impact of that. Students, what do you see when you look at that river? Water you can't swim in. Water you can't swim in. Can you paddle in it? Not really, do many? I think the rowing team does, actually. Yep, yep. Anybody else see anything else in there? Forest? Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm hearing impaired. Water resource as a resource, absolutely. Yeah, to this day, water remains the most energy efficient way to transport goods. And I just saw a barge on the river. I got to stay in the Indigo yesterday. Look down on the river, I could see the barge and the tugboat there. Well, today I would like to share a little bit about and hopefully inspire you to begin to look at your river, this beautiful river here. It's so pretty, I took a picture, I sent it to my, texted it to my wife. I said, this is just beautiful, that you'll see it as so much more. You see, we have a lot in common. That's my river, that's your river, railroad bridges across it, long history of railroading. Coal, we're the third largest producer of coal, Pennsylvania is. You guys aren't far behind, behind West Virginia and Wyoming. We're the second largest producer of natural gas. You also are a resource extraction economy, big into it. You have hydroelectric dams, so do we, four major ones on the Susquehanna River. We have nuclear power, so do you, on your waterways, shown there. In fact, nuclear gives you one thirty percent 
Coal used to give you a bulk. You're, we're about the same percentage, believe it or not. It's remarkable. We have a lot of rural poverty in Pennsylvania. We have a lot of people who just simply don't have access to treated uh, drinking water, sewage. We're on my, I'm on a septic tank. I have no access. Very poor internet speeds, very difficult. A lot of knowledge gaps and a lot of cultural differences. We have a lot of uh, racial injustice in Pennsylvania, especially in York County and things like that. Terrible, terrible hurdles. Environmental injustice as a result, our zoning, all the poor live along the rivers. They're the ones that are washed away during the floods. Some of them in Susquehanna, the worst are occur during the winter because the ice freezes over and the ice breaks up like icebergs and it floats down and then it jams on these rivers and then it floods on the bridges and then it floods the community, the trailer parks and we have to go in and evacuate them in 40 degree water. Mm. We're a river school, you're a river school. Think about that. I know about your football, you know about your football and that's part of the identity. Football brings in a lot of revenue. But fundamentally, I'd like us to think today that I'm part of a river school. That's my identity. The black warrior runs through your identity of this university. So cherish it. Cherish it. Begin to see it there. We have endangered species, pollution. We have pathogens in it. We have emerging contaminants and micro and nanoplastics. I see them now even in the tissues of the species. Our smallmouth bass have so much endocrine disruptors that 92% of the bass in the Susquehanna have both male and female organs. Holy cow. We have a rich Native American legacy. There you see Tuscaloosa, the Susquehanna tribes there. Many of them around us, all around us. The Delaware, we have over 17 tribes in it. And they're still there. We have river bay connections, so do you, Tom Bigby, but also all the way to the coast. Lots of dams, locks, rounds. But you also have a lot of natural beauty here too. And I see that, and I hope you see that too. I would venture to say that I wonder if Alabama is the same as Pennsylvania. Do you know that hunting and fishing in Pennsylvania brings in more revenue than all our major athletic teams combined? That's football, basketball, hockey, baseball. And I know people love to fish and hunt here. That's an ecosystem services. There's a lot to that. But there's a rich heritage and history and art. We're connected, you and I. You may not have thought about that. And so about 18 years ago, when I arrived at Bucknell in 96, as a pro and I'm, I'm a professor there, and I in, w was really involved in a lot of really interdisciplinary focus was then. Because that's the reward incentive structure for t faculty. We become experts in, a, in some area till you get tenure. And, that's what and, and you publish in a very prestigious journal to get there. And then over the years, it was becoming multidisciplinary. And now we talk a lot about cross-disciplinary where the boundaries of the discipline are crossed, but really the techniques and details aren't. You define a multiple working hypothesis. You design an experiment, you collect data, you analyze it. You could do stochastic or statistical or numerical modeling or some other way to quantify and assess it and whatnot. I may work in other, with other disciplines, but really the techniques are not ideal. And our students, and today, Students that come to the universities, how many of you wanted, you probably fit the norm, 65% of undergraduate students who come to college are interested in some form of environmental sustainability. But something happens within the first year. The universities, and I'm part of this, we're failing to inspire and to connect them to how that works because you gotta get a job, you're gonna have bills, and there's a lot of pressure on us to that. And so there's a lot of interest in, for years we spent as we started to look at interdisciplinary, where we blend the practices, multiple actor, active fields. So that's also expanded this. 
And so my thought was, how could we leverage the beautiful Susquehanna? We sit right on the banks of the river, just like you sit on the warrior as a module. Our first part was challenging. It was trying to actually get the curriculum to green it up. You could call it blue it up if it was water, but we were an environmental. So we started an environmental center. And to my surprise, it consisted of engineers and chemists and physics and mathematicians, geologists, environmental studies. But then the psychologists came in, then the social scientists, then the artists came in, then the musicians came in. Then the, the literature, the writers, the English. Everybody was looking at the river from a different perspective. So how do you do that? Well, ecosystems engineering teaches us this. You can go from a degraded system, you can go from a university academic setting that's not really functioning well when it comes to cross or interdisciplinary. And I'm gonna get us into where we really wanna go and that's transdisciplinary. But with, so we have these abiotic barriers. There are barriers that are imposed upon it. Students, you may not think about it, but they are imposed upon you. You have a very strict, organized set of courses you gotta get done to get a degree in engineering or any discipline. That's, that's abiotic, that's just imposed to you by the, it's there. But if you can get through that, by modifying the physical and the chemical, what I'm talking about sort of the the reactions among us faculty, facilities, students. So I'm thinking along the lines of all nature and can we apply this to move our academic, our university systems till they're actually functioning and they're intact and they're self-regulating. We're not there yet. But I wanna share you about some of the things that we tried, experiments that we're working on. How's that sound? These are the people that we had to engage spent a lot of time offering workshops on faculty, listening to them, not talking at them, listening to them and hearing them. Those were some of the most enjoyable times. Do that, do that here if you're not doing it. It is so fascinating. Discussion groups, food was often involved, Zach's on to the key things, but it's really important because when you share a meal together, you trust one another, you see one another, things happen, good things happen about that. That led to department self-studies. So we had traditional geology programs taking a fresh look at them and saying, well, you know, what does this mean now? How do, how do we, how does it, well, they, that didn't take too long. That was pretty obvious. You know who was ahead of the curve on almost all this was not the sciences and the engineering, it was the humanities. Provost and executive staff, that didn't take long. This was actually solving a lot of problems because they were reading in the Chronicle of Higher Education the need for students to be able to be, to have a multi-faceted education so you could grapple with the confounding issues that we're facing today. There's no unique solution and it involves more than one. So you can see the set of things there. We can go back to that. We were functioning in this traditional set where we were looking at water sustainability on campus. And you could talk about resiliency, you could talk about it here. How resilient are your systems here? And we began on projects here where we wanted to say the students, and we leverage the power of the students through the local waterways. The students get things done. Administrators will listen to you because you pay the bills. And also, you're the collective energy. You feed and impact us faculty far more than you realize. We're here to work with you. You're what energizes us. You're what stimulates us far more than you realize. So, get involved in the conversation here. And before long, it didn't take long till they started saying, well, let's capture the water that runs off our roofs and use it to flush our toilets or to irrigate the lawns. Let's restore some of the degraded, they were looked like ditches, they, were, they used to be streams, and daylight them. And so the sort of the back theme to my talk today is how do we explore our river? How do we teach our students? How as we as a universities, can we look at the world and I'm just gonna say for better or worse, as a liberal arts lens. With our common goal at here, at this prestigious university and my small little college, is to help all of us. We teach the students, but we end up teaching ourselves too. To identify what really are the issues, they're often hidden. 
unspoken. Understand, I like that word. If you understand me and I understand you, there's a lot less conflict in the world. There's a lot more efficiency. That's a big word, understand. And how do you address these confounding issues? I have two points to this. I think as a river school here, you should embrace the fact that the necessity of water combined with the complexity of the legal, the economic, and the cultural issues. We're newcomers here, the natives were here, that are connected to it. There are racial injustice issues. There are environmental injustice issues. There are all kinds of issues related to water. And in order for us to adequately adapt this, especially as a major R1 institution like you are here, the world's looking to you for these things. It demands then an equally complex and an interdisciplinary array of approaches, not to, to address them, but most importantly, can you find solutions? I believe we can. I believe they're gonna be interesting. They're probably gonna be unanticipated, but let's start the conversation today, here on Earth Day. Let's do that this year. And once we learned how to see the world, once you learn how to see the Black Warrior River in a different light, Perhaps through the view of a liberal arts, you can refocus your time, you can refocus and you can even magnify its importance. You can place it in context and you can provide new opportunities for faculty, for facilities. Well, let's talk about all the agency. So can we move to a point where we're doing true transdisciplinary exploring. Transdisciplinary is where you have multiple academic and non-academic fields. That involves public, that involves athletics, that involves facilities, that involves all kinds of non-academic fields. Interacting, co-mingling. You'll find that some of the smartest people aren't in academia. Now we know that as faculty, we're specialized. That's, we have a different role. But this university, this program will benefit immensely from those issues. It takes time, but it doesn't squander it. It's worth the investment. Because we need to really grapple with what are the social challenges? What's the response that the community is gonna be? How can I take my knowledge about intervention from ecology, a biologist in the room? How can the sociologist, how can the psychologist teach me about what an anticipated response or help me understand why this people group remains in this sort of mindset? And if I can understand that, most of the problems goes away. I like that word. It's gonna bring depth. It's gonna increase your audience. It's gonna increase your viewpoints. It will energize you and you'll become more self-aware. At our small school, are we pretty similar? Do you have, we have three colleges. For better or worse, it's organized into engineering. We're in, we have arts and sciences, and then we have management. I'll show you, I just put up here on dots. It's a little blurry. These are the faculty that over the last 15 years have connected to the local Susquehanna. I'll just give you a couple stories so you, you know it's, it's not made up. You can imagine how the geologists went to that. There's so much to study onto the baseline chemistry, the natural history, how the drainage network has evolved, stream capture, how it relates to structural controls. Geologists are really insightful about deep groundwater. You know, this river doesn't dry up too, even when it's not raining, so groundwater's connected to it. They bring a lot to the table. But the boy, do the chemical engineers help us when we're trying to deal with how do you design right now they're working on how do you drive sustainable membranes that can treat PFAS that's in all of our waterways. Right now they're rigid membranes and they're pretty expensive and you gotta throw them out, that kind of stuff. Pretty cool stuff. They also talk about treatment systems too, which is really important. Environmental engineering is dealing with all kinds of related to, we have a lot of wood waste like you do, forestry is right behind agriculture, and that's the bulk of your organic uh, recycling in your energy sector here in Alabama. We'd like to have that redone, but also we don't have a good composter. We don't have a scaled biodigester on campus too. It's shameful. 
the engineers say, well, it's not really an engineering problem. We know how to do that. And that's where the sociologists come in and they help us understand these things. And you know, the education's involved. They help us understand education and the inertia. Animal behavior is very fascinated by how muscles will mimic biomimicry and they'll m m mimic a fish here. And so now we have the, the computer scientists and the electrical engineering taking micro sensors, which they epoxy on the shell of the my muscles, and they can use the inertia sensor in there and they're monitoring how many times that muscle opens and closes. And then they're actually getting back fluid pressure mounts so they can determine, scale it up. The results are like, overwhelming, like if you had that uh, sewage treatment plan of that level of efficiency. It goes on, it goes on. Philosophy, religion, those give us insight into what values. I wasn't trained like that adequately as an engineer and then as a geoscientist, my degrees are in there. I'm having to learn that through dialogue with these people. All those things bring in. Economics, what are the incentives that will drive people on the whole societal sector to change their habits and water usage. You with me here now? You follow me here? This is true transdisciplinary and the connections are in there. And I hope you can find yourself. We've just commissioned a, a Grammy Award winner's drummer, Allison Miller, came down from New York City and just did a wonderful, phenomenal jazz piece on the Susquehanna. Artists are involved. Theater, we have dance. We just did a bee dance related to, you know, bees dance, you know, when they pollinate. So we had the whole day. It was wonderful. We even had the Susquehanna yoga. Yeah, yeah. And you can do that too. But um, all, it, all joking aside, it's actually very meaningful because it's engaging my mind with my body and my heart. And those are powerful forces. On campus too, we have other things here. We have um, the, so we have a lot of the, our ROTC is very interested on the strategic initiatives here and, um, and also the, the effects of our outdoor ed experiential learning, the outdoor club, the hikers and the bikers, they're very much into the paddling sports and, and they want to beef that up. Facilities is a huge thing. That is something we never really interacted enough with because there's no incentive for faculty to do that. That's got to change. In order for our campuses here to be a living learning laboratory, that's got to change. So what do we do? We partner with facilities where numbers of classes just began to instrument and collect data. We organized it as a center. So you could think here as the institute or center working with faculty. And let's say, and we picked it, we took two years in the planning, but over thousand students, 17 different classes. We electrofished it, we modeled it, we sampled it, we instrumented it, and then we were the first university in the mid-Atlantic states to daylight a stream, bring it out from a buried underground to now it's now a free-flowing system here. And that's instrumented too, that artists painted it. Sociologists interviewed and studied the value of it. They changed, they also look at the student impression. They worked with admissions to see how much important that would in, improve the aesthetics of campus. You're with me. We're changing our classrooms. It's too hard for faculty. We are so busy just trying to get our lectures prepared, manage students, especially at the graduate level and whatnot, that they need help. And so one of the things we discovered is when I left my faculty position to join this to, to help create the center, this water transdisciplinary program here, I got course releases. So my time was able to redo to work with other faculty to help them revamp existing courses where they could have true immersive experiential learning experiences for the students. And the historians came on by boards. History never partnered with us, the engineers. And all of a sudden we wrote books on the mechanical engineering professor working with the historians. This is the last working water mill in the United States. It's just 20 miles. It's in the same watershed as Bucknell. And so we connected there. People love the town. There's a connection with the local community, which is an agricultural community, which tends not to connect to campus. And we're now teaching rivers as in economics, they're commerce, rivers as commerce, water value. It's changing how they teach no matter what the discipline. It's all connected to the Susquehanna. 
So when you look at the Black Warrior River, it could be the same. Biology, ecology is very, very active in that, so is that. We are also flood prone. And so we've been instrumenting the bed of the river with sensors, as you could see the student here deploying. Looks like a lobsterman. She's dropping concrete blocks with sensors, and then she measures the longitudinal and the groundwater upwelling with buoys and water quality and whatnot. We measure the impact. That's an eel that was worked with the students, worked with the Fish and Wildlife Service to reintroduce 500,000 eels that couldn't make it over the dam, and now they've been monitoring their growth over that. We take the students out to farms, and that's sort of funny, but if you really want to see about gas and farming and manures and nutrients, they need to see it. And then it takes on new meaning to their hydrologic models that they're building that model not only nutrient pollution, but erosion and sedimentation. Local wetlands, which surround us around here, can also be instrumented. The geologists love this, the biologists love it, the artists love it, the birders love it. There's a poet who goes and writes poets there, and then she reads them. And forested ecosystems, and then applied research in the areas that things can come out, stream restoration. And this isn't to brag, this isn't, I'm not trying to share, I'm just sharing stories of what we are. That's what they asked me to do here. But none of this would have happened had we not connected with the artist, the sociologist who took us back there. We learned the presence of beaver and how important they were in the local watersheds. They were completely extirpated by 1859. The streams don't even look today like they looked like prior to European settlement. And that led us working with a German professor who translated the early Moravian diaries, the first most accurate written accounts of what the area, because they, William Penn was a Quaker and he sent Moravian uh, missionaries and they were the first to talk to the indigenous people. And they wrote, took copious notes. And so now we're going back with ground penetrating radar and seismic and reconstructing and locating some of these beaver dams. So we have a whole different idea. And in the, in the field of ecological reference, that's called the guiding image. It's a painting in your mind of what the potential this landscape could hold. Because the end result here on Earth Day is to bring about ecological and societal uplift, social ecological systems. They're coupled, and I'm increasingly aware of that. You can only do one partly, but you gotta do them both together, and that requires transdisciplinary report. So I spend a lot of time asset mapping, looking on campus, looking around the campus. Who, where are the strengths? Who's doing what? What's your story? Engage them, because it's really important there were the stories of the Paleo Indians, whose petroglyphs are on the beds. All the stories that come out of Moundville, right here. We had all the historians and how it was used, the river was used in the past. It was the 50th year of the most deadliest flood, Hurricane Agnes. That was new to me. Social scientists collect data in very different ways. See, multidisciplinary didn't show me that. We still have the same approaches. Transdisciplinary is they collect data, it's stories. That's one. And I, <laughs> it's incredibly powerful. It tells you a whole lot about that. I did have this slide up here because I think it's only fair to me to be realistic. I said earlier about what it's in incentive reward structure because we're all really super busy. For better or worse, this is what it does. The students were able to offer research, and boy, is this, this I, I am overwhelmed with the, the caliber of the work that gets done at this university. It's just, you are so fortunate, students, to be in such of this. And can it transcend all the way from graduate, postdoc, graduate, down to undergraduate? Experiential learning, can you help faculty take existing courses that they're sort of tired of faculty? They just don't know, and they're just, they're just tired because they get on this committee and that committee. The answer is yes, you could help them. You just say, how can I help you do that? Do you, need, do you need a boat? Do you need people to help organize the snorkeling trips? Do you, need, um, do you need to help getting access to the land? The response is, you can anticipate it. <laughs> Would you do that? I'd be happy to. And the students really get out of that. And um, that, that having a network of field stations where they have already have access, especially to new faculty, they don't know where to go. 
And if you could say, well, we have a written agreement or we have an agreement on this property here, there's a nice wetland and we have three wells there and we have a couple, <laughs> the world is good. Greek life. We have a very big Greek life on campus. I know you do here. Connect them. They're full of desire to do good and desire to have fun. And I discovered that, yeah, environmental stewardship can be really fun. They get a lot out of it. They get all the awards. They connect with other students. And athletics does the same. So we have the football team cleaning up, no kidding, golf balls out of the stream, out of one of our driving ranges. We have the tennis team doing other things. They help with composting. This was a stretch. This was pretty hard for them. But would you walk up to a giant linebacker who's standing by the recycling bin there in the cafeteria to sit and say, nah, I'm not gonna throw it there. You do what he tells you to. And he says, oh, that goes in this bin, that goes in that bin. You see what I'm saying? It's just, it's small, but it's actually multiplies here. Um, for the faculty, what was really important is that when they get involved with our center, that we had negotiated with the Committee on Tenure and Promotion and with the Provost, that that is formally recognized. That in all faculty students, you have to do research, teaching, university service. There are other expectations, but there's a lot of behind the scenes stuff that your professors do that you wouldn't know about, but it's expected to them to get tenure and then also to get promoted and to maintain. And so if you can do that, if you can help them with grants and grants management and free them up to do what they're best, everybody's better. And so over the years, you can create this collaborative web and in, you're already connected with most of these. This was a hard for us, but not really. As it turned out, what was a big surprise was how many of the federal partners who don't traditionally work together, but you can be the nexus. You can be the person they do to. So we have the U.S. Geological Survey working with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service through the Susquehanna River at our small school. They never do work together. They don't even share the data. It's, it's odd, but they don't. They have different missions, that's why, and there's no reward structure for them. Um, the same with regional partners, organizations, Trout Unlimited. Um, it goes on. We have the River Basin Commissions. We have a number of the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, Susquehanna is the largest supplier of water to the Chesapeake Bay. But new courses, new workshops. And let me just give you now in the, in the, in the closing, I just want to, in the closing two or three minutes here, I'd like to just show you some. Zach asked me to talk about the second part was curriculum development, which I hopefully have shared a little bit about. But what about stewardship? Because that's really what we're talking about, transformative. Not, it doesn't, we're not, we at Bucknell now realize that we're doing the service, we are insufficiently, to su adequately teach young minds is to expose them to some of the issues, address in absolute transparency all that's at stake, all that's at play, identify the knowledge gaps, identify the cultural barriers that are preventing solutions, and then start to pick it apart. Well, if that's the barrier here, then maybe we ought to invest time in that rather than doing this. And how many of you have been parts of projects where you've spent millions of dollars invest trying to clean up a section of a river or some something like that when you've not even addressed this real stressors the real problem that's in the environment so this is my attempt at that on campus these were the partners other centers and that's hard work that's not glamorous work students and faculty really appreciate the water center when they do this they work with a lot of other centers and institutes on campus but it's vital Policy is part of it, the Institute for Policy, Center for Social Science Research. So what you identify is these are gaps we don't know. Will you partner with us on those? Machine learning, artificial intelligence is very, very important as we collect these data sets. So computational sciences are really important. The Performing Arts Center, 
where we have the, uh, the, the artists that come in, and then where our theater and art students perform and our vocal and our music majors perform. Very, every semester there's a piece related to the river or some local town or something like that. The graduate school, the athletics, I think you, you, was a surprise to you. Uh, this was the most biggest shock to me. It was the most underlying resource to us for ideas and solutions. Your alumni are very successful, and they're successful because they really have multi, they get this trans, this player, they just get it. They have a very high social IQ and they get it. One of our alumni was Ken Langone. He started Home Depot and a couple other things like that. And he's like, well, yeah, 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 let's get this done. And so the Board of Regents, other people, they listen to senators and they listen to your alumni. And that was really helpful for department chairs to gain in and to trust with these, you know, they don't feel like they're just getting left behind. The local community, you'll have your own list of things. That just gives you an idea of some of those there. And then finally is um, about 12 years ago, we partnered with these universities. We had a little bit more resources, but they also live right up and down the river on us. They are also our river schools. Well, you've got a community college or two in here. I think Skidmore's in town. Aren't they or close? You have a number of colleges around here. That's been absolutely wonderful, collaborating with these other schools. And how do we do it? It's just a snapshot of some of the, some of the, ki the students that are funded. Zach's been to our Anna River Symposium, and you guys just put on your second symposium here. And they'll all come here, and they'll present. And we have our Native Americans. That's the spiritual leader for the Haudenosaunee. That's the highest ranking person for the Haudenosaunee. That's the seven nation Iroquois. They go all the way down to the Carolinas. And his wife, Betty Lyons, came to another one. She is the representative on the United Nations Council, powerful woman, interacting with students. They come to the symposium to give us a Native American perspective on water and sustainability. And you can hear a pin drop. And I learned so much from them. We partner with our local river keeper. They have different objectives than us, but that partnership does bear fruit. It bears fruit for the students. It helps their organization, on your organization there. So, if this was your patch of woods in your yard, how would you use that forest? How would you use a tree in there? Anybody? How would you use a tree? What would you do with a tree? Me? Yeah. I wouldn't touch it. You wouldn't touch it. She'd leave it be. That's one answer. Anybody else? Any woodworkers here? Just hiking there. Just hiking? Yeah. Yeah. I would want to make a chair out of the tree. I just love working wood or carve something from it. How about you? Firewood. Firewood, absolutely. Fuel, mm -hmm. sustainable. Do some camping. How about you? Hammocking. Hammocking. Yeah, rest and leisure. Shade, peaceful. How about you? Um, let it be there. I let it be? Yeah. Yeah. How about you? Sweets. Swing. Yeah, mm -hmm. That one's good. That's a good one. <laughs> Let it be. Let it be. Hiking. Let it be? Yeah. yeah. Here we are. We didn't know anything together. But I didn't know you at all. But we share so much in common. And how we would probably, I would agree, use all those uses too. I think I like the swing or the hammock the best right now. That sort of sounds nice, doesn't it? But I didn't get to your group here. So you group here. I started with this question. And now, having heard what we've said, when you see this river, what do you see? Opportunity. That's right, opportunity. He just won the Jeopardy $5,000 prize right there. Thank you very much. It's been really nice to be here with you.